Hey everybody, if you enjoy the podcast and the content it provides, be sure to hop over and check out the community. The community is an exclusive members website that is just an extension of what we do here in July at the Central Virginia Sport Performance Seminar. What it is, is a combination of video lectures, a coach's corner with your Monday morning take-home information, and a forum where you can talk about anything and everything related to the field of strength and conditioning. In the community, you'll find content added each month from some of the top practitioners in the world, ranging from PhDs to high-level coaches, bringing you exactly what they're doing with their athletes or their research at the present moment. On top of that, an additional discussion by coaches bringing you that Monday morning information, things that you can add to your training program right away. Tying that in with the opportunity to discuss with coaches around the world in the forum on anything and everything from the topics addressed in these presentations to whatever you're seeing in your daily life as a coach. If this sounds like the right thing for you and your staff, go ahead and hop over to cvasps.com slash community and try it out for 48 hours for just a dollar. If you like it, you're signed up, ready to roll, and you're jumping into all the great content added each month. If not, feel free to go ahead and cancel at any time. No questions asked. We're really excited about what we're building in the community and hope you are too. Go ahead and hop over to cvasps.com slash community and check it out today. Hello and welcome to another cvasps.com podcast. Today I have the fortune to be able to sit down with Coach Hank Krasenhoff, one of our fantastic presenters for the 2013 seminar. Hank, let's get right to it, my man. You've been well known for your extensive work with track and field sprinters. Um, Let's talk a little bit about how things could be a little different when you're working with a track and field runner versus how you handle a team sport athlete. Team versus individual sport, how does it change? In, uh, how does it change? Well, it's a very uh, uh, simple, I think. Uh, in what perspective do you see this? Uh, the team versus, versus individual sport or developments in team sport and developments uh, separately in individual sports? Or, or in, what's the wider perspective of this question? Yeah, I, you know, looking at, at your background, having... Uh, obviously, your, your primary focus has been the sprint athletes. Um, but you've had success and worked with, you know, football clubs and things of that nature. How does your approach change with a Juventus versus, you know, a, a sprinter? Oh, it, it's, it's very simple because um, in the end, each team consists of individuals. And uh, that's the one that one, uh, uh, sounds like a cliche, but it, it clearly isn't because in the end, there's somebody scoring the goal. It's an individual. If you work in a soccer team, it's not 11 guys behind the ball and all at the same time their foot kicks the ball. So it's 11 feet kicking the ball. It's always one uh, guy out there who fails or who succeeds. And it's, of course, a team making in this uh, possible. I understand it very well. On the other hand, I never worked with uh, specific technical or tactical problems in, uh, in the field where I was we are more concerned with the mental problems, the nutrition and the uh, physical conditioning of these uh, teams. So... Well, most sports I worked with, the, 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 even the basic rules escape me. Uh, I have been working with Omega Wave. I was there in Finland uh, two weeks ago. And I've been watching American football for one of the first times I could follow the whole match because after 10 minutes I, I just get, gave up most of the time. I don't understand the rules. So it, it's useless to watch it if you don't understand the rules, you know? Yeah. Sports are beautiful to see even if you don't understand. But American football, if you don't understand the rules, you don't know what's going on. So we're watching... American football in Finland, with uh, uh, which was dubbed in Russian, so that wasn't interesting. And there were people from more countries there, so that was interesting. For the first time, I understand the beauty of uh, football. But there was no need to, because the only thing that people wanted is getting stronger, getting faster, and, and uh, recovering faster, and, and get less injuries. So that was my main concern. Also, in, uh, I don't see the finer tactical things in, in, in tennis or in any sport. But... There's no need to. So that basic ignorance allowed me to work in many sports and on the specific uh, fields of nutrition, mental factors, and, and conditioning. So that's it. So as far as that one became important, I was uh, asked to, to consult in there. And fortunately, I had not much to do with the other 
the other parts of uh, other uh, issues in, 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 in team sports. I got you. So really, when you're your focus doesn't change very much because what you're being brought in to do is very similar in, in both situations. Well, there is something that is uh, what I try to uh, learn, what I learned in, 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 in coaching for 30 years is that very important uh, is, is the basic. If you understand the basic of biomechanics, there's not much difference between throwing a ball and throwing a javelin. If you understand the basic mechanics of sprinting, it doesn't matter that much if you run straight forward, run the curve, or with the ball in your hand. It doesn't really matter because if you, you the basics are right, and that is what most people forget. They uh, got up in, 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 in the details or in the very specific things. <clears throat> but you, if you allow yourself the time and the patience to create a good background in, in all the basic fields, then it doesn't matter if you deal with a cyclist, a two the front cyclist, a sprinter. If you know physiology and biochemistry, you know that. So that and also periodization, all these things become kind of simple. But of course, you have to understand which muscles work when you have a tennis serve or you, when you uh, <clears throat> throw a ball. You have to understand which muscles work. But that is basic uh, kinesiology, nothing more than that. Mm -hmm. So when you have the basic right, you can apply it to almost any sport. It's always a human being, the, a man of flesh and blood or a woman of flesh and blood, trying to squeeze the best out of him or herself. So keep that in mind, and then it's not an easy to make that step from general knowledge, basic knowledge, to that specific sport. And of course, every sport will try to convince you, Hank, listen, this is completely different, you know? This is not <laughs> athletics, this is soccer. This is completely different, you cannot compare to anything else. I go to rugby and say, Hank, this is rugby, this is completely different. This is, you cannot compare to soccer to anything else. And then the tennis player and the golf player, they always try to convince me there's something special. And I, I say, well, it's not. <laughs> The more because they all state this that is uh, that it's completely different. Yeah, you know, everybody, if you sport thinks they're so damn special. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but no, that's that's a great way to put it. That no matter what, it's just the flesh and blood and all the the rules and laws of biomechanics and physics and physiology all apply to the yeah. same people the same way. Yeah, yeah. The psychology. Uh, it doesn't. I always I wrote a little book. It's called uh, the Art of Performance. Already a long time ago, just for fun. And um, I even brought it a little bit further, and I said, and I said there's no much difference between a, 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 a piano player, a classical piano uh, a player uh, playing a concert, or, or a violin player in, a, in an orchestra, or uh, an actor, or uh, an actor on stage, or a scientist, or a special forces soldier kicking in a door in, uh, in, in the house where you expect terrorists. The anticipation of something to happen, something that is relevant to you and important to you and, and, and probably a threat of loss, that's the same to everybody. So there's no much difference even between the fields of uh, uh, military and law enforcement, uh, science, arts, performing arts, or sports. So I try to see this in the widest possible way. Yeah, no, that's, <clears throat> that's a real interesting way to look at it. You know, n Now, when you say that, you're, are you just talking about the physiological stress response, or are you talking about the physiological adaptations that are going to occur, or...? Uh, basically, basically all of it, because don't forget, uh, in Holland we got uh, very much addicted to these 10,000 hour rules from Ericsson and uh, popularized by, by uh, Malcolm Gladwell in his uh, books. Yeah. That was mainly also derived from piano players and musicians and chess players, not from American, American football players. So, uh, Ericsson stated that he has never seen a talent, you know, there's always this, uh, if you see somebody performing very well at a young age, he had his, at least he, had, he or she had his hours in. And, uh, well, in sports we see people performing very well without making those 10,000 hours. Uh, and, and later the research proved him more or less uh, wrong in that. In Denmark has been some research done on elite athletes and they were elite athletes only by 5,000 hours. It's half of what of the 10,000 hours. So, but everybody is trying to make his 10,000 hours now, which is kind of stupid. Yeah. <laughs> so, oh, I'm almost there now. I made 9,999, 10 hours to go. I'm really, and then I become really good all of a sudden, you know? It's not like that. There's this, uh, this guy who comes from rugby, uh, uh, and uh, he started to be a discus thrower, and he is uh, throwing the discus 66 meters after uh, less than two years of training. So all of a sudden he's there at the at, 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 uh, elite throwers of the world, 
in a sport which is very competitive, which always exists for more than 2,000 years, discus throwing is one of the oldest sports there is. So a very high on the on the ladder of uh, uh, evolution in sport. All of a sudden, he managed to, to get in there with, uh, well, for sure, not 10,000 hours of discus throwing. That's the reason why these guys are, uh, are older guys or over 30, you can still be world class in discus throwing because, yeah. It takes a lot of experience to do it very well, and this guy managed to do it in less than, than well, probably uh, even 2,000 hours or something. Wow. One to the best in the world. So, coming back to your question, it, it, doesn't really, um, it doesn't really matter. You see more physical adaptation in sport, because your body is your instrument you work with. But so does the piano player. The piano player, if he cuts himself a, a finger and loses one or two fingers, he won't be as good. Also, his or her body is an instrument. The only difference is that for the athlete understands that his or her body is the instrument on which they make their money, make a living, and treat it most of the time very well. For the CEO of a major company, their body is just, most of the time is a limitation. It needs to sleep, it needs to rest, it can work 24 hours a day, uh, it needs to exercise once in a while. So for them, their body is a burden, and for the athlete, it's an instrument which they use. So that's the different perspective of the CEO where the load is mainly cognitive and emotional, and the, and the athlete where the load, total load is more, more physical. Well, let's jump back a little bit. <clears throat> you were just talking a little bit ago when we were talking about the team situation. Yeah. You, you brought up periodization, which is always a, uh, an interesting topic to talk about. Yeah. Now, now, working with a team sport that is in competition four, six, eight months out of the year, how, how does that vary? How do you how do you alter that versus your your track and field athletes where you're, you're prepping them once or twice a year for a meet? Yeah, uh, once or twice. <laughs> <laughs> okay, not even more than that, fortunately. But um, you know, the the limitation of uh, of a, a, a team sports is that it's it's a team. So basically, every has to be everybody has to be on the track uh, uh, um, at or on the field at 9 o'clock or 10 o'clock or 11 o'clock or time at the same time because it's kind of useless to kick a ball and you're the only guy out there in the field and you kick a ball or throw a ball and you're the only one out there. So you always have to be together because technical and tactical facts can only be trained in uh, in, 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 uh, uh, in the sense of, of a team. So with a shot putter or with a sprint, you can go out in, uh, to the track on your own and, and, and work with them. Now, this is kind of a, a problem because in the team we have different positions, different people, different uh, uh, bodies from the outside, different biochemistry and different psychology from the inside. And the only thing you can do is train them all together at the same time. So that means the load for all these guys, basically, if you go out in the field, is in principally the same. So you go out in the field, do your stuff, and all of them have the same training load. Now, well, a few people will do it uh, 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 whistling without any training effect because the training load is too low for them, they can handle a lot of load and want to do more and, and can handle more. For the average player, well, you hope and you guess that uh, the training load uh, suits them well. And there are some people who, uh, for, for whom this relatively light training load, the average training load is way too much and they get injured all the time. So the thing is, as a smart coach, you try to focus on the average most of the time and, 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 and uh, differentiate or individualize the training for the very good athletes, uh, very good players, and for the players who, who don't do that well. This is always the problem with team training, because you have to have, you make a training program for the average, not for the individual. So that's where the main progress is, work towards the individual. So give every player what he or, his, uh, he or she can handle on a daily base uh, uh, and on, on, on an individual basis. This is a big step to take, of course. Now, we have a history in soccer in, uh, in uh, Europe, and well, we found out that the goalkeeper has to do some different workout than, than the rest of the, the field. Right. We also start to understand that uh, attackers have a more of a, more of a different person, different person, different uh, 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 tasks than the midfielders or the defenders. We start to understand that. So we start to work in clusters now. That's already a, a, a giant leap forward in team sport, but the real uh, uh, and of course, in American football, in in the US, it's, it's much more developed than in Europe if, uh, as far as team sport is. So you guys look at the individuals and and, and individuals already much more than, than than we do here in Europe, as a matter of fact. So you're way beyond us uh, already. Well, that's Tony. not. I wouldn't have guessed that. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
I think I wrote something about the Russian and the American perspective. Uh, you know, this, so you're always looking at, 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 at Europe or at Russia or at what the Chinese are doing or whatever. And, well, the grass is always greener at the other side of the hill. You know, it's always greener. You're always thinking people are doing better, good or doing better. Not probably knowing that the other guys are looking at you and you are doing because you're so, so good in, in, in all kinds of uh, uh, sports. Look, if you were an American football player, why would you look at, at how the Russians play or how the Chinese play American football? I wouldn't. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, if you want to play soccer, you look uh, to, to Europe. And, and now Europeans uh, look for conditioning, soccer conditioning, they go to the US. Oh, wow. So, that's kind of strange because there's no. Well, I wouldn't say any knowledge, but there's not much experience in it. Well, we have 50 years of experience of conditioning in, 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 in soccer, at least. But, you know, at the other side of the ocean, things always look brighter, newer, different, if you don't look well. So I try to look everywhere and then see, oh, okay, well, it's like this. And step away from this idea that at the other side of the fence, things are done much better than... than uh, the most interesting things I found uh, were right here under my nose, here in Holland. Just the fact that people were abroad that were, well, they come from Finland or from Spain or from Italy they, or from England or the, uh, the US. They know so much more than we do. And, and basically it's not because all the scientists meet each other in Congress and do the same kind of research. It's not really uh, necessary to think that abroad is always better. <laughs> no, understandable. Especially when you're talking about a situation where you are the lone participant in the activity. Um, but then, then let's look at, at the actual plan then. If, if the practice plan dictated by the manager or the head coach yeah. is set for the guys that are in the middle of the road, so then how, how do you see the alterations occurring with the elite or the higher level versus the, the guys that aren't quite as prepared or aren't quite as good? Oh, it's very simple, uh, because that's where the, the, the great opportunity is for conditioning. Because you, uh, they're not pushing that, that, uh, that uh, uh, dumbbell at the same time with you in the bench press. One is uh, uh, pressing uh, 200 pounds, the other one is pressing 300 pounds in the bench press. So that's why they, where the individualization, individualization and the nutrition plans and so on, that's where the chance is to individualize and to... to um, monitor and to, to control the training load as a matter of fact because I think sometimes the training load in the conditioning is, 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 is more than the training load in, in, in technical, technical skills as far as adaptation is concerned. So that's the chance to, to, uh, to adapt. And uh, yeah, that's I think where the great opportunity is. Not to, uh, I've seen uh, coaches put up 100 kilograms in, uh, on, a, on, a, on a barbell and then, then they go, okay, number one. Squat, 10 squats, okay, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. number two, yep, come on, 10 squats, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. number three, 10 squats, doesn't matter how strong they are, if they did it uh, easily or they, they, they got a hernia, it didn't really matter, everybody what, got the same luck, well, that's, that's, at that time, uh, strength training and uh, and conditioning got a bad name, it was somewhere down in the 70s, where even in, in conditioning, people did not individualize, the whole team was doing the same exercises, the same drills, without uh, considering the individual individual strength and weakness of a person. Well, that's why the opportunity is for conditioning coaches to individualize. And of course, it's very normal, but that's all it is. Like I said, in technical or, or technical sense, it's, it's much harder to individualize. You always need to be uh, with two, three, four, five, maybe ten people if you want to execute it on some new technical drills and skills. Well, that's awesome. Yeah. Um, or as a, I think the periodization is kind of, let me say, it's a kind of a um, fossil. Periodization models are a fossil from the 1960s, 70s. Number one, where do the periodization models come from? Russia. Why didn't we come up in the last 50, 60 years with our own periodization model? Why do you come from? We have a couple of models. It's Matveyev, it's Vyachansky, it's uh, Bondarchuk, and it's uh, basically, well, yeah, Vyachansky... Uh, is Surin come up with some new ideas? There are some mixed ideas, you know, okay, take one a little bit of piece of this take and, and make our own idea, but there's no basic new idea. They all come from Russia. Now, Matveya started in the 1960s uh, looking at all kinds of sports and coming up with a very in intelligent uh, piece of work, of course. And if you look at this periodization, for the first time, people start thinking about it uh, seriously and, and putting things in numbers and graphs and so on. 
but uh, uh, he said that only 30% he started it because you look at your Olympic Games or the World Championship, the European Championships, and only 30% of the athletes managed to peak, have the peak performance at the championship when it really counted. So it's so 70% of the athletes on average counted uh, a peak before or after. So that's why he started basically the idea of periodization. Peak when it counts, and of course that's in the major championships or the tournaments when it counts. Well, when we look back 40, 50 years later, we know how to periodize now, right? But how many people really peak at the major championships or at the world championships or Olympic Games? I think it's not much more than 30% that it was. Yeah. Yeah. People still manage to peak before and they don't reach their performance uh, at, when it really counts or they don't do well in the Olympics and then two weeks after you see them uh, uh, beating the people that they that, uh, that they got beaten by at the Olympics. So, so far for, for periodization. It's just a generalized idea applied to the individual. Uh, the athletes who always peak very early and athletes who always peak very late in the season. And no matter how I change everything, it was very hard to change that. Why? Because the body is a biological uh, organism responding, for instance, to uh, um, biological cycles. Well, uh, we have a menstrual cycle in women, we have a circadian cycle in, in, in a day and night cycle, of course. And um, just as some people are morning types, there are some people who are evening types. Some people perform very well in the morning and in, 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 the, in the evening they just wear out. Some people have a little bit, take the time to wake up, they don't wake up until 10 o'clock in the morning, and but they do very well in the evening, evening time, especially in, in Europe, in the Mediterranean, Spain and Italy, where life uh, develops a little bit later because of the sun and, and, and the temperature and, and the cultural habit of in Holland, we are at 6 o'clock or 5 o'clock uh, in the evening, we have dinner. Well, in Italy, you go to dinner at 11 o'clock. So if you're already sleeping at 6 o'clock in the afternoon, then you won't make it until 11 o'clock until dinner is, uh, is there. So it's a, a cultural and a biological thing. Well, I think the same thing will apply to uh, 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 periodization. Some people peak early in season and some people peak late in season, which is not as much related to periodization as well, to biological and psychological factors as well. Well, then looking at a team sports season, how do you alter that? Well, here's again this chance to, 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 uh, for this uh, uh, conditioning. You look at the conditioning as the main guidance factor for, uh, for periodization. It's not the tactical drills and skills that you do because, yes, in the learning process, uh, as far as motor learning is concerned, it's, it's important. But as far as a, as a, as a physiological uh, or psychological load, it's, it's, it doesn't put much weight in the scale. It's much more the, this, this uh, sprinting session or interval sprinting session or weight session is a much harder impact on the system and can affect it in a negative or in a positive way much more than, than, than uh, uh, some throwing and kicking uh, out on the field, out there on the field. <clears throat> so this is, uh, 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 I made a, a kind of a model for uh, team sports. And it's always the combination between conditioning and, uh, and uh, there's always a fight, of course, between uh, or find, finding the balance between conditioning on one hand and the technical and tactical work that has to be done on the other hand, of course. And of course, the head coach will spend more time in yeah. technical and tactical, and the conditioning coach sees less and less hours being cut off of his program because of more time has to be spent uh, there. And I think it's kind of, well, old-fashioned and outdated idea that I think just more time should be spent on the on the on the on the uh, conditioning for for all kinds of reasons, also psychological reasons. Uh, as far as I can say. So, um, yeah, working with Juventus is a special uh, experience because it's a soccer team that has a very good reputation in Europe. Not anymore, but had a very good reputation <laughs> at the time, uh, well established. And the thing was, uh, uh, contrary to the uh, usual. Um, uh, concept. They hardly played soccer when they came back after summer holidays. They came back, and then everybody started playing soccer already. And they didn't. They didn't play soccer. They worked on conditioning, conditioning, conditioning. And um, strength became very strong. Uphill running, every everything you can imagine. And uh, the first. 
two months, they barely saw the ball. So in other clubs, it's quite kind of unusual kind of a culture shock. Hey, 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 because a soccer player, like any player, likes to work with the ball. He doesn't mm-hmm. like running out in the forest or, or pulling iron. He doesn't like that. He likes to play with the ball. That's a player. Right. Not an athlete. Different between the player and the athlete. <laughs> <laughs> Player likes to play. The athlete doesn't like to play. And um, so why, why is it? Well, it's very simple. The only risk is that the first couple of uh, of, of uh, competitions and the competition schedules there, we might lose something because our uh, uh, tactical concept is a little bit rusty when we didn't practice it a lot. And all technical. But you know, if you really have your ten thousand hours in or five thousand hours, you don't lose any skill in in, 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 in kicking a ball or catching a ball or throwing a ball. You don't lose that, even if you wanted to. So why waste the time there in, 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 in technical or, or, or tactical conditioning and build a good foundation for the rest of the season and then seem to maintain it throughout the season as, 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 as well, which was a, a, a strong point. So most people do some conditioning, very short, no impact, and start uh, playing the ball, uh, technical and tactical aspects. And then... In the end, they run out of fuel in the end of the season, not because they lose it on technical and technical aspect, but because they, lose it because, uh, well, they didn't build up enough uh, <clears throat> physical capacities. And then the main thing is uh, that used to be in the kind of uh, old days when people played a lot of competitions uh, uh, during a year, but in the really major sports, people play more and more competitions a year. Yeah. So the real, there is no time for periodization. In former days, we used to have Lafayette, a long preparation period, a general and specific, and a competition period. But now, it's basically a preparation period of this, and then it's competition, competition from the beginning to the end. So there's very little time to really focus on, 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 on preparing things. So the most thing is, preparation has to be done now throughout the competition season. But this is interesting because that gives much more power to the, to the week cycle. So how do you make a week cycle? What do you do uh, the day after competition? What do you do the day before competition? When do you plan the weightlifting sessions? When or not? Not at all. Do you maintain strength as a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a physical quality, or this well, this is enough. We can we can maintain it for two or three months, and we put away the the barbells, and then we just play. Very interesting question. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Lots of uh, things to think about. Also, food for thought. Yeah. Well, I don't see it as a job. If you see it as a job, I think you're on the, on the, on the wrong side of the line because it's, a, it's an art. You're basically an artist. So that's different than a job. It's not a 95 job because you're talking about 20 hours. But it doesn't, to me, I look, always never look at quantity. It doesn't, I don't care how many people hours train. I don't care how many, people, how many miles people run. I don't, I don't care how many pounds they lift or how many tons they lift. I look at the quality of it and the result of that. So I never look at people can't impress me. Oh, I run 200 uh, or 100 miles a week. Can be impressed. Then what what speed? You know, it, 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 that's more important. Intensity and quality is always always uh, key to me. So I never care about the volume or the hours. People, well, we, we train 20 hours. I wouldn't be ashamed if one of my athletes would be Olympic champion and trained only one hour a week. I would go well. <laughs> yeah. There's a lot in there. I, I don't care. But well, as coaches, we're mostly driven by anxiety. We are mainly driven by anxiety because, especially conditioning coaches, are driven by anxiety. Anxiety that, well, we didn't do everything we could, or we didn't give it everything we had, or, or, or we didn't do enough work. Well, that's not my fear. My fear is <laughs> uh, that I did too much work, that I had underperformance, or overtraining, or injuries. Because that's going to be that's looking when you look at the numbers. That's a big limitation in each sport. That's what breaks people's careers. That's what uh, uh, stops them from competing or competing at the level they should. That's the real uh, danger. It's not. I never see under-training injuries. Under-training injuries don't exist. When an old guy like me, I, I start sprinting right now, I pull a hamstring. That's an under-training injury. But for a normal athlete would train three, four times a week, the under-training injury isn't there. It's always an over-training injury. It's, a, it's, 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 it's a, a term by itself, over-training injuries. So if... 80% of the elite athlete is at the edge or uh, crosses the line of overtraining, then what, what should be the lesson? Don't train that hard, damn it. <laughs> train as much as necessary, not as much as possible. Well, it always applies. It always applies. You know, I, that's yeah. the greatest line. And, and 
<laughs> with that in mind, and that's a piece that when working in the, in the college setting, I think that's kind of where I was going, is when you have sport coaches that want more, 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 how is the conditioning coach, do you monitor, control, and make sure that you're giving them what they need, mm -hmm. especially on the, the physical preparation side of it, when you can't have that sort of pull with the sport coach to say, yeah. hey, today is a no-go. Yeah. Interesting question. Look at this angle. I'm a fundamentalist. Number one, <laughs> you want me there as a conditioning coach or you don't. So you give me an opportunity to do my job or you don't. If you don't, if you say, well, Hank, uh, for the next six months, you, uh, um, I don't want to waste an hour on, on, on being in the gym or uh, lifting weights, then if the money is good, say, well, I stay and go and drink a cup of coffee or have a beer or waste my time or read a book. And if I'm really not paid that much, I'll say, well, thank you very much. I'm going to look for another job. But then, at the other hand, I'm also used, I am come from track and field, which is a, a, a pretty poor sport. There's hardly any money in it. Yes, I know. Haile Gabriel Selassie or maybe uh, 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 Usain Bolt might make a lot of money, but it's very exponential. So only the top three uh, guys make a good living. Then the finalists make a mediocre living, and the guys who doesn't make it to the final makes uh, a living uh, less than you and me do. So uh, uh, we are used to improvise or to do with very little uh, uh, um, equipment, with uh, very little uh, 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 facilities, accommodations, uh, very little. So it's okay. How many hours do I have? If I have two hours a week, I make sure they'll be ready in two hours a week. If I got five hours a week and do it in five, you got ten hours, hey, that's too much. Yeah. <laughs> These kids can even kick a ball. So what do we do? Uh, teaching them sprinting uh, ten hours a week or lifting weight ten hours a week. First make sure they can kick a ball, they can catch a ball. First get the, get the basics right. right. I don't have ten hours a week. And I'm a lazy guy, so if I, I can only get this on amount of time, I can uh, spend my time somewhere else. I don't really care that I can do it with very little time. Give me... Uh, the time that I need. So they always ask, how much time do you do you do we need? Uh, as a, I asked the other question, how little time do we need? That was how little time do we need. So if I want to get people in bench press from 100 pounds to 200 pounds, not how much time do we need, how little time do I need? Oh, so that that kind of focus is is uh, gives a completely different view on training. How little time do I need, really? Look, if you have a headache right now, and I can't imagine after sitting here for one hour with me, <laughs> you don't take 10 aspirins to get rid of your headache. Take any you want. You can take 10, but you get a hole in your stomach. Maybe your headache is gone, you get a hole in your stomach. Are you willing to pay that price? No. So you take one aspirin. And if half an aspirin will do the same job, you take half an aspirin. That's, that's the job. You look at the therapeutic window. You always do this on a daily basis. Just not when you're a coach. Not you particularly, but everybody. Everybody looks at... Okay, how much can we get? We look at efficiency and everything, but not when coaching. We have to keep the hours in. We look at expanding the uh, amount of hours. I need more hours. I need more hours because otherwise, otherwise what? <clears throat> so not how many hours do I need? How little hours do I need? You know, it's from experience. And uh, if you think you need more hours, well, probably you're doing an inefficient job. So, uh, yeah, no. I, 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 right, I, I'm with you there. I'm, I'm definitely, we're definitely on the same page there is, is looking at the process and not how much do we need to do, but how little do we need to do. Yeah. Yeah. So when there's the conditioning coach looking at it in that realm, mm -hmm. how do you look at a sport coach who you're going to have to work with that is going to say, we need to do more, we need to do more, as in like... All right, so we need to come in and we need to do an hour of shooting drills. And then we need to come in later and do two hours of technical tactical practice that is full court or full field, 11 v. 11, 5 v. 5. Yeah. And how, how does this, I mean, how does the right way fit in with that? Okay. 
back later to the to the to the subject of uh, vibration. For instance, if you look at vibration training, the first uh, protocol for vibration was uh, ten times one minute. And ten times one minute, one minute vibration, one minute of one minute vibration, one minute of was the first protocol developed by Carmelo Bosco at the time. Why? Because one minute, one time around the clock, ten times you got ten fingers. If we were cows, we would have gone four times one minute, I think, but we <laughs> ten times. And then one minute rest, why? Because one time around the clock. You have to start from somewhere. And then I asked myself, and very good results, eh? and explosive strength and everything. Then I asked myself, well, it's fine, I save a lot of money, by, uh, sorry, a lot of time, I save a lot of effort by do, uh, getting this result in explosive strength. But what if we do five? times one minute. And what if we do three times one minute? So, then in the end you ended up with three, four, five times with exactly the same results uh, uh, than ten minutes. So I say myself, seven minutes of vibration, it's not the time, it's again the risk of uh, overload, overload of the central nervous system or of the fatigue of, the, of, the, of, the, of all nervous systems uh, in the body. So, in the end, I have an ace up my sleeve, I have an ace up my sleeve. I remember I was coaching uh, Nelly Kuhlman, uh, one of the sprinters I coached in the 1980s and 90s. And um, uh, we had a, I was the junior coach for the relay team and the hurdles and sprints. And my, uh, my uh, national coach team, who was my boss, and I said, Look, I want to spend time with this uh, girl because I saw this girl and she's kind of strange. You know, she didn't run that fast, but she was kind of strange. So it could be very good news or very bad news. I think that's the bad news. I know what you're talking about. She's lazy, crazy, and stupid. She won't do anything. Well, it's a great that's a world record four years after, so we're calling her lazy, crazy, and stupid. Um, but then there was an other girl. And this other girl worked out five, six times a week running the 100 meters in 12, 20 or something, not very fast. And Nelly was working out one time a week if she felt like she wanted to train and if the weather was nice, which didn't happen too often. Also running 12, 20. So I thought, and he said, well, this girl, this other girl, I chose this other girl because she's so motivated, she's a hard worker, yeah, six times. Uh, if I could convince Nelly to work out two times, three times, four times, five times, six times a week, I could imagine what she would do. So again, she ran 12, 20, one time a week, but he thought it was better to, to run 12, 20, with six times a week. Huh. I totally disagree. I, 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 that's one of the lessons I learned in 1981. I still disagree with that. So I always think that you have more ace of the sheep because you can always train more. You can always train more later. So the, the increase of, of, of training volume or the increase of training frequency, that's a great asset. So keep it as long as possible because in the end, uh, that might be what you need. So in a knee-jerk reflex, kids train three times a week, it's easy to make them perform better when they work out five times a week. But then what you're doing is when they're 12, 13 years old, how many times a week would they have to train when they're 25? 20 times a week? Yeah. <laughs> because there's an end to it. There's an end to it. There's an end to it in, in time and recovery time. So I, I, I never look at, at, at training volume or, or, or training time. I only look at, at quality, intensity, and also the... the the intensity is not only the, the power output or the height or uh, the, the, that's intensity, but the, the quality is also the, the mental quality with which you absorb things. You go through the motions or you do it really well with, with the conscious thought. Uh, and, uh. So that's for me more important. Even as a selection procedure, it's more important than looking at people who train hard. Yes, well, most people train hard. I see that many amateurs run, train harder than elite athletes uh, most of the time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so how do you monitor that? So like, that's a that's an awesome point. When we talk about, well, we've got some kids that you know are very successful training one session a week. Some need three, four, five. How do you assess that? How are you? Sh I don't know if sure is the right word, but how do you figure that this is enough? This isn't enough. It's too much. <clears throat> well, one thing is look at progress. As long as the people are making progress, don't change anything. It's going into the right direction. As long as your car is still still moving, don't get out and try to push it. It's still moving, right? Mm -hmm. so the moment performance will level off. 
then it might be time to do something. That means increase the intensity, increase, increase the frequency, increase the volume, increase the order of training, strength and weight, uh, strength and speed, or speed and strength, uh, uh, do other exercises, uh, variation in training. You can do something. And sometimes you have to do less. So if people train out, uh, train uh, five, six, seven times a week, uh, I had a, a couple of really very good athletes, world, world uh, championships uh, medalists, which did very well with training less instead of training more. Because it was uh, endless repetition, always going through the motions. It was hard training all the time. And it's very hard. If people are used to train hard, to, they, they always doubt themselves and doubt me if they're training hard enough. Was this all? Should we do one more set? No, you want more set. Why not? I'm not tired. That's good. It's good because it's a very hard session. You're not tired. That means tomorrow I can have another quality workout. So being easy on them is not a gift or that I'm such a nice and soft guy. It's just to make sure that tomorrow they can even do another quality workout, another one. The guy who goes at full speed today, he cannot do a 100% workout tomorrow. He can only do 80%. And the day after tomorrow and the day after tomorrow as well. So I make sure I give them everything so they recover the next day. If the next day is a workout day, plan the workout day, they will be recovered in 24 hours. They need to recover because at that time they'll be able to do a high quality workout. That's what I'm looking for, not a quantity workout, a quality workout. Especially in the explosive events, of course, for, for marathon training or for volume uh, events or endurance events, I can imagine something else. But for the explosive events, I can imagine that you want full quality all the time, high quality all the time. And I think that that would really fit into the team system model as well. Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, even if you look at the average, then the sales, still the same basic rule applies. You look for quality. Mm -hmm. And it's much harder because you got 10, 20, sometimes 40 or 50 people. Uh, that's very hard for one single coach to watch. So that's why I have all the system coaches to watch it and to say when you have to step down or when you have to step it up. So that's, that's, the, that's the real key, absolutely, absolutely. But then again, many people are just training to train. It's not uh, training to win or uh, compete or training to win, and they're training to train. Because we want ourselves as coaches, uh, uh, um, we want ourselves being valuable, but we measure our, our, probably our salary or our value about the hours that we spend on the track, on the field, or in the gym. So I'm kind of a lazy guy. I don't, if I did a good job in one hour, I'll take one hour. But if I need five hours training, with one athlete, five hours trying to do good, I'll do five hours. I go to eight hours if I need it. I need it. Most of the time I don't. I need one hour, one hour and a half. Look at the quality, look at the, 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 the decreasing quality. Um, for instance, one of my rules is I prefer to see five good repetitions and five good repetitions followed by five less good repetitions. Because I'm training different systems, I'm training different energy systems and training different muscle fibers and that's where the injuries and the overload and the, and the overtraining comes from from these five never in the first five in the last five look at bench press we do bench press right for years and years so we think let me say 200 pounds not that heavy but 200 pounds of uh, bench press okay here we go one two three four five six seven eight no. Yeah. Okay. So well, intensity is the same. It was 200 pounds from the first one to the last one. No, it's not. The thing that decreases is the power output or the speed. The velocity of the movement decreased a lot. So what am I training now? Well, the first three, four, five, I trained fast twitch fibers, and the last seven, six, five, I trained slow pitch fibers. So if I want to train fast twitch fibers, why do we need uh, the, these ones? I don't need them. So stop at sets of four. That's it, and maintain the quality. Make sure that the power output is uh, more than ninety percent of the highest one. So if it drops ten percent, if the velocity of the bar drops ten percent, stop because now I start to train slow pitch fibers. If that is what you want, perfect. But if you're an explosive athlete or a shot putter or uh, uh, an American football player, I don't I don't think that you need to to look at hypertrophy of slow pitch fibers. I don't think so. So then I need to do a lot of work. Five now, I'm fresh, work my fast fibers, then five ones. It's not a sharp distinction between the five and the six. It's, it's gradually coming down. Mm -hmm. 
And you always use the mixture, of course, also in the first five using slow twitch. But the main thing is you use the fast twitch. And that's why the velocity drops, because the fast twitch run out of fuel. So, short repetitions, then I take as much risk as needed. Also by the same system, looking at the velocity. So do one rep. And if again, they're not, uh, they're still below the 90% uh, velocity level, take more rest, 30 seconds more. Do one rep, okay. Up again, come on, maximum speed. So, this is how I think it, it, it works. At least it works for me. <laughs> I don't yeah. think it works for anyone else, but it, it works for me. And, and in the end, it made sense from scientific point of view and from practical point of view and from performance point of view. When you look at the bar speed with those types of movements, what do you use to measure it? I, I, I use, of course, the only thing I measure is the velocity, which is basically uh, times the, the, the weight, is then the power output in watts. Right, but what device do you use to measure that? Oh, any device. I, I use, uh, there's many devices I use in the past. It's, uh, I used to uh, work with the Muscle Lab, which comes from Norway, which was invented by Professor Bosco, or the, the, the original idea was by Bosco. The Muscle Lab is, uh, is like the Omega wave for the muscle. <laughs> <laughs> it measures as a jump pad. It has EMG, 4-channel EMG, a goniometer, uh, accelerometer, a force platform, a power measurement uh, with a little box and, and, uh, and a rope for vertical uh, displacement, uh, and some other stuff, electronic timing, all integrated in one system. It's not a new system. It's, it's, it's on the market for a long time. It must not be used to work with. And now I work with, uh, well, new uh, with a smart coach. A smart coach is a system from Italy. <coughs> um, which can also be hooked up to the Versa pulley system or to uh, to the yo-yo system, you know, the yo-yo system, mm -hmm. uh, uh, yeah, the flywheel system. You can also hook it up to that to, to measure the, the, the power output there. So I, and now use, I use a smart speed, uh, speed system for that. And of course, it allows me to see the quality of the training either each repetition by each repetition. And again, it only, only does when you have only five athletes, when you have 50 athletes, yeah. It's going to be a little bit different. All you have 50 little boxes, that's okay too, because this, the smart coach uh, developer, which is a very uh, uh, good scientist and a good engineer, he, uh, he made a smart coach pro for, for team. So he hooked up the systems to leg extension, to bench press, to uh, a squat rack. So now, no matter what you do, you can also see your work power output. But looking at the power output, I think is the most important thing, uh, concept in strength training. Uh, Overall, well, that's cool. That sounds like uh, that the omega wave for the muscle. That's very intriguing <laughs> yeah. to me. Um, it's a force platform. I, 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 I love to work with the system. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> uh, cheap force platform, not a complicated one, but it gives you the sway part when you're standing on one leg. It gives you the Horizontal forces of the vertical forces, uh, of course. So it, it, you can do it, it, it's, it's a practical uh, system, and it, it's probably the best, the most useful contribution of Camille Bosco to sports. It, it's the muscle lab, not the vibration platform and the hypergravity system or the power measurement. It, it's basically this, this uh, system. But it's mainly known in Europe, and, and the guy doesn't do much work in the US. He's a one man band, basically. Also, a, a very uh, clever guy from Norway, and uh, Ole Olsen. And uh, yes, I've been working from the from the 1980s on uh, with the system, and I thought everybody worked with a system like it. But in the end, I looked around and nobody was working with a system. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Honestly, this is the first I've heard of it. Okay. Okay. Look at ergo test. Ergo test. Ergo no, test. Uh, muscle lab. Uh, then you see all the all the system. I mean. Uh, I tested many, many national teams with this national hockey, team, field hockey team, national volleyball team, and Holland Olympic champion volleyball. I tested all these guys and girls with this uh, system, Ergo Test. How do you spell that? Uh, e R uh, G O T E S T. Ergo Test. And a muscle lab, as you as you spell it. Uh. Muscle lab, Ergo Test technology. Yeah, that's it. That's it. Take a, take a good look at it. Uh, I'm, I'm one of the most experienced guys in this, uh, this system. With EMG, you did, well, yeah, right, yeah. The, the Omega wave for the muscle, it was, it was. It still is. <laughs> it still is. Yeah, no, yeah. oh, that's great. That's great. Um, yeah. How does the Omega wave fit into your training program? Well, I bought it in, uh, in 2000. I heard of it, and then uh, I made a phone call to these guys, and they were kind of shocked. 
because uh, uh, they weren't really marketing uh, marketing it uh, or, or really trying to sell it really hard. And then all of a sudden, there's there's this guy from from uh, from Holland running the system. So I went to uh, to Oregon to uh, to listen to these guys because it was too good to be true. It was too good to be true. When I I, I read, I said, well. The only thing that doesn't give you is your bank account and your IQ, but how can this be? So I was as puzzled as anybody else was, and uh, I went there to see and to listen, and uh, well, of course, they all came from Russia, and uh, the, well, more or less European educated background uh, uh, as well, and I, I had a lot of, a lot of books, uh, a lot of books still come from, from, uh, from uh, Russia, as a matter of fact, or translated into Germany, East Germany, was a a powerful source for me because from Russia, East Germany, well, you're German, and so you can read the East German books as well. So many of the works were translated into uh, into German, which we could read, not the original Russian work. And um, um, I bought it for my athletes, and uh, in the beginning, uh, I had a kind of seeing all the numbers and trying things out. Uh, something that were contrary to logic or to my, my uh, subjective perception. In the end, uh, it worked. As I started to, to. You have to read through the lines there. You have to read through the lines, and understand the basic concept of it. The basic concept is, is different than just put on the on the equipment and then see what is out there. The basic concept again. You have to have a, a kind of deeper understanding of adaptation and the physiology, and you read in the in in, in the normal physiology books. You know, it's, uh, if, if really your concept of supercompensation comes into play, it's, it's using the uh, omega wave, which, which tells you uh, what, what phase you are in, in the in supercompensation phase. In all supercompensation phases, so not, not the supercompensation phase, which doesn't exist. You know, there's, everything supercompensates at one time or another, and all have different times. So this is the cool thing you can find out in the omega wave. So one system might be recovered and the other one might, might not be. So I, so I started to uh, use my athletes as uh, guinea pigs, for this, try to sometimes use it as a backup system for my own brain. Sometimes using the, listening to the system only, overruling my my uh, my uh, experience. And uh, in the end, I found the balance. Uh, sometimes you have to listen to the system, and sometimes you have to listen to yourself. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I actually uh, and I, I have the system. Yeah. Um, I mean, I've had it for. About 11 months. Yeah. The secret, the real secret, uh, Jay, is not the system itself. It's, again, so here's a thermometer. I don't know in how many degrees Fahrenheit. In, 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 in Celsius, uh, it's 37 degrees. Okay, 37 degrees. Okay, everything's okay. If it's 39 degrees, it means, okay, I have a fever. Well, obviously, I have a fever. 39 degrees. I have a uh, high temperature and sickness dropping from my forehead. Now, the main question is, I have this thermometer. Now I know I have a fever. First, I think I didn't feel too well. Maybe it's, it's, uh, it's the, the, the heating system or whatever. But now I know. I know how much it is. It's 39, not 38 or 40. It's 39. Now here's the question. What am I going to do about it? So, and here's your view. If you give, if you tell an acupuncturist, and said, look, here's his ethic. The sympathetic system is uh, way up and the parasympathetic system is down. What do you think he's going to do? He's going to pull his needles and plug needles in there because he, he has nothing else. Mm -hmm. He doesn't look at nutrition, doesn't look at psychology. I go to the psychologist and say, hey, sympathetic system is up, parasympathetic system is down. So I say, well, I think this athlete is stressed, mentally stressed. How was the relationship with his parents? Yeah. <laughs> Psychiatrist. <laughs> now he's looking at the nutritionist. What's he going to do? Pull out the needles? No. Think about mental problems? No. Going to look at what supplements can I give him? How is the diet going to change? So everybody looks with a different view to the same outcome, and this is where the real secret is. So the real secret is not the numbers. The numbers are not very interesting. The thing is, how am I going to manipulate those numbers, uh, those uh, results, to bring it back up again or to bring it back down again? So this is the interesting one. And um, well, now I made a. a, a, a a flow chart by, uh, by spending a lot of time and money and, and dangerous things to do. I worked with uh, psychi psychiatrists, yes, a psychologists, sports doctors, pharmacologists, pharmacists, everything, to look, okay, now some, some value is up. What can we do from a psychological point of view? What can we do from 
nutritional point of view? What can we do from physical therapy point of view? What can we do from any angle? Any angle. So what we did, test somebody. Okay, baseline, go. Send to the sauna. Come back after the sauna, test again. What happened? What does the sauna do to your body? Okay, take supplements. Take a supplement, take the pill. Three hours later, see what happened to your autonomic nervous system, what happened to your central nervous system. Oh, that's interesting. That's interesting. That's really interesting. <laughs> and, uh, you won't believe me the things we did. We took antipsychotics to see what happened to the nervous system. You know, It's only once and it was in control of people who knew what they were doing. So you take a pill, take an antipsychotic and see, wait, don't feel anything, don't, no strange things happen. And then again, after three hours, look how your body responded to the antipsychotic. Not something to copy. Don't try this at home. Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> but it, it, it is extreme. We, uh, we went. So basically, the interesting is to, uh, as a, in the morning, it's a measuring tool. You can measure what is happening inside the body of this athlete, which he, normally, he or she normally doesn't know or knows, but doesn't, doesn't want to tell. You know, some, uh, one of my athletes, Troy Douglas, a sprinter, 20.17, uh, uh, no matter how I destroyed him yesterday in the workout, today comes to the track. So Troy, today, five times 150. Can you know, he said, yes, Hank, man, bring the pain, man. I know I can do it, man. I can run 99 today, man. Well, that's a two heroes already. Okay. Oh, you should have said it before. But athletes, even if they know what's going on in their body, they don't want to, they, it's this, well, they're humans too, like everybody else. Like everybody else, so people are basically have no clue what, how they feel, how stressed they are, how tired they are, because you have no reference there. Look at your at, in your car on your dashboard, you can see is the petrol tank is empty or full. You can see how your temperature of or the, or the oil is and the water is, and you can see how fast you're going and how many rounds per minute your engine is making, and so on and so on. Your body doesn't have that, so we tell athletes, well, you have to listen to your body. Well, the bad thing is the body doesn't speak. The body just mumbles, you know. Mm, 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 mm. So you don't know. You say, "Well, say, I have a pain here on the left side of my breast." You don't know if I was have been sleeping on my left shoulder and have a little soreness here, or that I got my first heart attack. You don't know if you have a headache or a brain tumor. You hope it's a headache, and most of the time you have a, a, a headache instead of a brain tumor. But basically, you don't know. So the body doesn't say anything. This is this is the bad thing. Even your cheap car has a dashboard in which it shows the numbers. Your body doesn't say anything, it's just numbers. So, the subjective experience of the athlete is not adequate for you to say or to see if this athlete can handle this workload. In field athletes, most of the time, or in, in, in team athletes, most of the time, I coached guys of the national field hockey team. Very good in Holland, eh? field hockey is one of the national sports, and um, I did the strength and conditioning, and look guys, Today, we're going to uh, have uh, something with the stick and the ball. So, hey, yes, some specific uh, uh, work. Okay, yes, but nobody tired? No. Nobody injured? No, 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 let's go. Okay. So, oh, wait a minute. Oh, sorry. <clears throat> this next week's program. Today, we're going to do an interval shuttle run in the anaerobic. Uh, and people, oh, wait a minute. Uh, oh, I feel my injury. I feel my injury. <laughs> I'm very <laughs> tired from yesterday. Hey, wait a minute. That's stuff they don't like. So, how come? They're injured or they're not. They're tired or they're not. Because it's always, look, if I have a little fever and um, I have a party with my friends tonight and I have a, a very small fever, a, a, a nice party, I'm looking forward to it, the small fever really doesn't count. If I have the same small fever and I have tonight and dinner with my mother-in-law, believe me, I feel very, very sick. Objectively, it's the same thing. Yeah, but it's always, we always have intentions. We always have, have something. Uh, so if an athlete, he tells me, uh, he has, tells me, yeah, Hank, I can do it, I can do it. I know, because if I tell him, if he tells me I'm tired, I'll tell him, hey, you go back home and rest. He doesn't like that because he sees, next week is natural championships. He sees his opponent sprinting there. So too. He's training and I'm not. So I'm losing because he's training now. So there are all kinds of reasons to kind of lie about their the, the, the status. They don't know their status, and if they know, 
they cannot even tell the truth. If you ask people how many calories you take or how you do you eat well, everybody seems to eat well. <laughs> yeah. When you come to calories, how many calories do you have? They come to what, 1,600 calories. When you put them, lock them up in a room and have a free food and everything, you see they eat much more. So there's a difference between objective and subjective. Uh, we, have, we, we, we just have this. Uh, we are, we are human beings. We, we can lie, so we, so we do. Even if we don't intend to, we don't know the truth. So people eat a handful of peanuts, well, you know, in between. Oh, yeah, but, you know, peanuts. Yeah, but it's only a, f a few, so they don't count as calories. Or, uh, you know, I took a, 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 a chocolate bar or whatever. Oh, yeah, that was just a little snack, you know. But there's not many calories in chocolate. No, 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 no. So they kind of tend to neglect it or forget about it. And your omega wave is the same. It's kind of a lie detector as well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it tells you about the lifestyle of the athletes more than anything else. Right. Because you can control the three hours that you that you see on the track, on the field, or in the gym. You cannot control or see the other 20, 21 hours what they do. Are they going out uh, uh, to have fun with their friends, uh, going to party, or... They're going to sleep early. Well, the Omega Wave will tell you they won't, but the Omega Wave definitely will. <laughs> the, the biggest thing that I'm starting to understand, mm -hmm. how to track the information, what you're looking at on the information, mm -hmm. um, and then actually deciphering what it means. Mm -hmm. And then the big question that I have is when that, that beautiful readiness report comes up and yeah. you're like, Okay, we got all this. What signifies yeah. high intensity, yeah. high volume? Yeah, exactly. And it's because how we are talking, mm -hmm. unless it's needed, there won't yeah. be high intensity or high volume. So uh -huh. it's what, what, when we were, if we were to put it as like a, a continuum, yeah. is it all based off? Is, is high intensity work above anaerobic threshold? Is high intensity true plyometrics? Is high intensity heavy lifting? Yeah. You know, I mean, even a, a 5K yeah. could be extremely high intensity. Yeah, it is, it is. It yeah. is. A thousand meters is sprinting for a marathon running. He called, we're going to do sprint training. He said, okay, some flying 30s, no, thousand meters. He yeah. called sprint training. For him, it's high intensity, of course. So, High intensity is a relative value. It has to be related to the intensity at which you compete. <laughs> so, <Yeah. laughs> that's number one. But um, uh, basically, it doesn't really matter because your autonomic nervous system is going up when you run 10K. It's uh, going to 170 for an hour uh, or a little bit uh, a little bit more. Uh, so th that's one. Or if you run 100 meters, it's going up to 200 for 10 seconds. So it doesn't really matter. It's just uh, because you're measuring the cardiac system, your high intensity is always going to to, 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 be, to, be, to be challenged. But I, I agree. But this is where the, um, the more you get into specifics and in your, uh, not diagnosis, but you know, the outcome, the more you tend to go wrong. They're very general terms, but it has to be because the system is read by the weightlifter as well as the, as the, as the triathlete. So you say, well, high intensity is uh, above 80% of your one repetition maximum or is above the anaerobic threshold. Then the other guys say, oh, what anaerobic threshold? I'm a weightlifter. I never go over the anaerobic threshold uh, anyway or I'm never under the anaerobic threshold or whatever. So you, there's difficulties in interpretation because it's like a tree, you know, like a tree that you start with the trunk and now you have to define intensity and volume for the weightlifter as well as the triathlete. And then you have to, again, to define all these things. So that's going to be a, a, a challenge and a very difficult job to do. So I always stick to the simple things. Okay, no high intensity, no high intensity. I remember I ignored it one time. I said, incomplete recovery in your body is not able to handle high intensity work. I thought, well, you know, 25 years of experience. Athletes, how do you feel? I feel great. Okay. What can the system tell me? And uh, this athlete will never injure it. And this athlete did five runs high intensity, and the fourth run, straining the hamstring all of a sudden, never injured. So I said, mm, maybe it's good to listen to the system because yeah. I ignore the fact that sprinting at high speed is high intensity work no matter what. So, yeah. 
but it's going to be difficult because you know the main the main challenge you have is different is, is dealing with uh, with definitions of, of what is intensity. So is intensity only the load or is it the power output? So there you go wrong. <clears throat> For me, it's a power output, not not only the load, you know, the training load in, in weights in kilograms or in pounds. It's also the, the what power output that you have. <clears throat> so that's why you go wrong. And um, that's only based on the training then. The system would then be useless for clinicians, psychologists, nutritionists, because, well, they never do with intensity or volume, they deal with uh, calories and they deal with mental stress and they deal with other things. So then you need to have a different flowchart again for all different types of use of the omega wave. So that's why it's very general. The moment you go one step further in, in the, in the, in the, in the, in the, uh, uh, how do you say it, uh, the, the outcome or the results, uh, elaborating that one step further, and then you tend to go wrong. It's very subtle there. That's the way the edge weighs, and okay, what I'm doing now? Tell them what high intensity is, but is high intensity in cycling, like the Tour de France, or high intensity weightlifting? Right. And this is where they had to stop, <laughs> basically. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's the that's the part that right now I'm trying to wrap my head around, because you know we looked at, we took the the bar graphs yeah. from what our guys did and, and performance wise yeah. we did very very well in this off season and you know yeah. knock wood yeah. we're, we're, we're holding things pretty well right now yeah. um, but when you look at the aerobic and anaerobic numbers it's kind yeah. of going the wrong way yeah. but when we monitor recovery and practice mm -hmm. you know it's in a two minute interval we've got Heart rate recovery dropping 50, 60 beats a minute. Uh huh. You know, so it's, I think we're fit, but it's saying that we're not as fit as we were. Um, you know, when, it, when we look at performance measures, like the, the one that we track just for ease is vertical jump, just yeah. on a, a jump mat. Yeah. On, you know, backing down and taking, basically just throwing everything out we didn't need. Yeah. We improved on average about five and a third inches in vertical leap. Just, good. yeah, and it's Very just good. with, um, I don't know if you've heard, um, I'm sure that you've read Natalia's father's things, and, and but the progression to the depth jump, yeah. we just got to doing kettlebell jumps yeah. with three or four guys of my yeah. 15. The rest of them are just doing what he referred to as his Consecutive barbell jumps, yeah, just yeah, an empty barbell. Yeah. That was the most intense jumping activity they did. Yeah, and it's like, so I look at it and it's like, so we never really did anything that I would call high intensity. Exactly, exactly. And then mm. our our performance numbers mm -hmm. are improving, our recovery numbers are improving, yeah. but it's telling me we're not as fit as we were. So that's why where I'm looking at it and I'm like. Mm. Hmm. But it's Did I get on the wrong boat? You know? For fitness. High oxygen uptake, how is it going to help your basketball player? High oxygen uptake, it's not going to help you. So fitness has its limitations. How fit do you need to be for that specific task? And people overdo fitness, so I think that overall fitness is going to help you. Then, yeah, um, uh, try to get your player as fit as a oxygen uptake as a marathon runner uh, and as fit and as strong as a weightlifter, it's not going to work because you, uh, that's not the task you have to do. So you have to look at specific fitness here. Well, overall general fitness, oxygen uptake might drop a little bit and some things might drop a little bit. And then that doesn't, it doesn't measure because you're not paid for, for, for that. There's no medals in, in oxygen uptake. There's medals for winning a marathon. Like I said, um, in Holland we have this thing, of course you know it, core stability. Yeah. Everything happens 10 years later here, course stability. So course stability. People have to have a strong course stability. So, well, suppose you have a very good shot putter in Holland. He was third in the Olympics. No, he didn't make it. He made it to the final. Well, his shot putter is normally 21 meters. Rutger Smith from Holland. Very good guy. Big guy, huge guy. No, suppose this guy cannot stand on one leg for uh, one minute. So he's like, so should I do more course stability with him or not? That's a good question because... There's no, suppose he can stand five minutes without moving a millimeter on one leg. Would it improve his 
shuffle performance or not? And how much time do we have to spend in order to improve that? Could that time not be better spent in mental preparation or in physical preparation or in technical or whatever? Now, that's my question. I make that balance. That's, that's my question there. About And the same thing applies to, to uh, physical training. How much do you really, how fit do you really need to be? And we waste a lot of effort and a lot of time and a lot of also uh, energy to, to uh, make people as fit as they can be. Yes, but you will see if you're not fit, you'll drop out really soon. And the interesting thing from the Omega Wave is there's a lot of me talking and lots of things uh, talking about central nervous system, central nervous system, central nervous system. Well, nobody really knows what it is, central nervous system. I've never seen a measurement of central nervous system. We know about strength, we know about power, we know about endurance, we know about anything. It's what you take muscle biopsies and look at glycogen levels and everything. But when it comes to central nervous system, yeah. Well, I can see it because, uh, yeah, because what? Because what? You can. The only thing that helps you out is the Omega Wave. I was uh, two weeks ago, uh, last week, I was in Germany with a special forces uh, unit. I tested the whole platoon of these guys. And the only thing that stood out was uh, very fit guys, very fit guys, doing a lot of tactical drills. And then the only thing that dropped was central nervous system because when you're shooting the live ammunition, you have to be really sharp. You know, otherwise, you shoot somebody else in the back, one of your, uh, one of your colleagues in the back. So it doesn't really help. Um, and then they looked at central nervous fatigue. They said, wow, central nervous fatigue. And then I was filming some stuff. And then you could see him. The guys with central nervous fatigue, you see him mess up. They make, make errors in decisions. They make, make coordination errors. You know, if you have a, one of these grenades with the flashbangs, you know, with a, a bang and smoke and, and, and uh, comes out to confuse the opponent and you're coming through a door, standing in front of the door, and I throw the flashbang against the opposite wall of the door. That means against the wall. He was, he was uh, standing alone. So, but nobody was standing there, so he didn't, he was standing here and he hit, not inside the door, he hit him here. And it, <laughs> the only people getting confused is the, is the team. Yeah. So, central nervous system. So you mess up in decision and anticipation and reaction and coordination and communication. You mess up in all those very small things. You can still uh, run a mile pretty decently with central nervous system, but you can't do anything that has to do with explosive strength or with coordination or with uh, speed. Or leave alone more complex things like decision making. It's going to be messed up. So that's one of the few event, uh, one of the main advantages the, the Omega Wave gives you. So it's a testing thing, it's a teaching thing. If you want to teach what the autonomic nervous system is or what it does, use it. So you do anything that you know jacks up the autonomic nervous system, and then for the first time you can see the numbers what it does to the sympathetic and the parasympathetic thing. So it's a teaching tool for teachers as well. And it's for me, it's an um, it's a, a, a learning tool because. Uh, not only monitoring my athletes, using it as a, as a, as a real uh, tool for monitoring athletes, but also as a learning tool to see if I could. Many things that I thought I was doing right, I was doing wrong. Because now for the first time, I saw the effect of my interventions, of my workouts, of, of going to the sauna. So I thought, well, you know, drinking coffee, what does it do to you, drinking coffee? It increases the heart rate, right? It doesn't. It doesn't decrease the heart rate. Coffee. So what we did, we took six cups of strong ristretto coffee, the strongest of the strongest, six cups within half an hour. Okay, my assistant took before and after, into the heart rate and the sympathetic system came down. Is it possible because caffeine is a sympathetic or mimetic? It, it, it increases your arousal. Yes, it does, and people will never drink coffee. <laughs> if you're a habitual coffee drink, it drops it. Well, that's an interesting one. <laughs> that's an interesting one. So, yes, it depends. It depends. If you never drink coffee, after six years, your hair is like this. If you're a bit of coffee drinker, it's completely, it, it quiets you down. You see, the coffee, uh, friend, I just brought a coffee. I can't sleep without an espresso, uh, otherwise you can't sleep at night. If you never drink coffee, you drink an espresso, you cannot sleep at night. Mm -hmm. You no. get headaches and huh? headaches and grumpy. And, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So that, that's what you learn with the Omega Wave. You learn, you learn the, uh, the, 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 the quality and, and the effect of your interventions, and what kind of events they are, on an individual basis. Well, some people might not sleep with coffee. Some people can sleep without coffee. Now, for the first time, you can see it. 
so that's a valuable uh, asset to me as well to learn uh, to to as a, as a as a learning tool for myself. And that's why the Omega Wave is a challenge because it shows where most things. So instead of making things easy, it makes things more complicated. But I think that's the beauty and the challenge of it. It shows you all super compensation phase, aerobic, anaerobic, the autonomic nervous system, the central nervous system. It shows you all, uh, all the, of the uh, um, super compensation phases and adaptation phases. Well, that's a challenge. At least it was a challenge to me. Now I understand completely. <laughs> yeah, I'm hoping to figure it out. You know, it's, it's a day-by-day -day thing, you know? Yeah, don't get frustrated. Looking at the mental side of training. It's Finns Lombardi, I think. Uh, Finns Lombardi training, uh, puke like every workout to make you mentally tough. Or, well, there's something in our 1930s, and even the Navy SEALs don't do this. They do it for a very short period of time just to weed out the, the people who are mentally tough. But it's not about being mentally tough. For instance, um, in a selection procedure where you have to select people, you just make them run. And there's one guy who used to stop because he's, uh, his, 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 blood, his shoes are full of blood because he has a blister. Now, okay, you say, oh, he quit. He's a quitter. Good, you kick him out. Well, he might be an ex uh, excellent soldier, an excellent operator. The only, his only problem was he got blisters. But he said, yeah, but he's, then he shouldn't quit. He should go through the pain. Right. So that's easily said because the other guys, they said the other guys didn't quit. No, they didn't have blisters, so of course they can run. If they would have blisters, would they have quit as well? Or maybe they would have quit earlier. So it's a, it's a very irrational uh, uh, um, uh, selection procedure. Mental toughness has nothing to do with being uh, uh, macho or being cool. It's doing the right things at the right time, under pressure, in complex uh, situation in there. And for us, the situation isn't that complex. It's very simple. At least at 20 meters, you hit a gun, and then you just run between two lines, and the guy is at the other side. It's very simple. Mm -hmm. So yes, you have to perform under pressure. Absolutely true. Most of the pressure is anyway is a perception. It's not, not real. It's, it's 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 not realistic pressure. It's a pressure we we think there is. Or uh, it's. I take my athlete to the stadium, Olympic stadium, uh, before and I say, okay, look at this. It's empty still, right? Yeah, yeah. How far is it from the starting blocks to the finish line? Hundred meters. Okay. So, would it really change? If, I mean, if if it would be full of people, tomorrow is full of people. Would it really change the hundred meters? Would it be longer or? Would the track uh, make you slow you down? No, <laughs> not at all. So basically, it doesn't make a difference. Mm -hmm. No, not really. Think about it tomorrow. Yeah. It doesn't make a difference. Unless everybody starts like blowing like... <sighs> then you get a hell of a tailwind or a hell of a headwind, depending on where they're sitting. But that's the only thing they, they, they might be uh, making right there. <laughs> so it's basically not. It's basically not. Most of, most of the pressure is a, is a perception. We may, don't make it tougher, and don't don't, don't think that you can um, create a tougher guy that's going on with a broken leg. You're just an idiot. It's not a tougher guy. It's not mentally tough to reward, to walk on with a broken leg or with a, a, a shoulder popped out. What's tough about it? It's stupid, because it means. When you're mentally tough, and most of the time there, there's a very uh, um, uh, there's a very thin line between being brave and being stupid. <laughs> <laughs> and there's a very thin line between being tough and being mentally tough and being stupid. No, just do whatever you have to do, and uh, it's not. I understand. I, I um, uh, have a few phases. So mentally tough, you can be mentally tough. In normal life, you know, people worry about everything. People worry about uh, uh, paying bills or worrying about uh, the guy in front of them at the traffic light uh, is too slow, so they're mm, honking the horn because he's too slow. Yeah. Okay. Mentally tough? No, no, no. It's usually you jack up your blood pressure for nothing. Then, anticipation of the event, whatever that event might be, might be a match, might be a, a, an, an operation, might be a, a, a Surgery doesn't matter. Man. Anticipation. You can be mentally tough, and people who think about, oh shit, I have a negative uh, perception of outcome already, and nothing happened yet. Then you have the actual action. It could be the competition, the match, uh, the the operation itself, and then you have the resilience. The fact if you bounce back from that, and then another phase which is called adaptation. Did you learn something from that or not? 
So the next time you go in, you go in with, with the, the, the anxiety in your heart already. Ooh, I hope that this time nothing goes wrong. Or you say, hey, we did it uh, very good last time. So now we better prepare to get more experience, so we'll do it better. So there's different phases in mental toughness or in, in the mental part of, uh, of uh, preparation. I teach these two special forces as well. <coughs> and uh, all these phases uh, can, can, of course, be trained with special, uh, with special ways. But they need to be trained depending on the task you are, you're looking for. So it doesn't make sense to kick in a door if you want to uh, be a good basketball player. Kicking in doors doesn't make you very, very tough. Yeah. <laughs> So it make, makes sense to, to copy Navy SEALs and, 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 uh, and uh, lift boats over your head until you puke or go into the water and so on. It's good. It's challenging, absolutely. Uh, bungee jumping doesn't make you a good... Uh, because most of the time you think there's no transfer from what you do as a mental toughness training to what you have to do in the field. So yes, I do these things with athletes as well. I do it. But it has to be very carefully... Uh, 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 transfer to what you have to do in competition. So, bungee jumping, yeah, great fun, you do it or you don't. Is it going to make you a good basketball player? No, but you have to learn the lesson about that, that your body, the effect of your thinking and your emotions on your body and the effect of your body to your emotion, your knees start to shake and everything. So, how are you going to deal with that? So, yeah, it's, it's very important, but, well, it's not, it's not the easy solution to make people mentally tougher by making them, make them physically tougher and make them puke all the time or make them very, very tired or, or make, them, make them scared. It's not going to help anyone. You destroy a lot of people in the process, I'm afraid. Yeah. Well, and then there was an, a podcast you did with the uh, Canadian Coaches Center where I don't want to say it wrong, but I think that the quote that you, you had was mental preparation is good training. Yeah, or yeah. sports psychology is trusting your training. That's what it was. Yeah, exactly, exactly, exactly. Yes, absolutely true. Because, uh, well, we learned to separate the body from the mind, or the mind from the body, uh, 400 years ago, and that was kind of uh, stupid. So now you have mental coaches, but don't forget, every training is mental training. Unless you have a mental coach, a mental coach. Oh, I'm a mental coach. So okay, interesting, because that means you're 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 working with this, and I'll be working with this piece of meat that hangs below the chin. Yeah. Has no brain, doesn't listen to me, uh, so this is my job and this is your job. It doesn't work this way because I can never neglect my own impact of what I say, how I walk, what I do, what I mean, my own emotional system to the athletes I'm talking to. So everything you have has, a, has, a, has, a, has an impact, negative or positive. So everything you do to praise them or to, to uh, crack down on them, always has an impact. So don't forget, you're always there as an example, you're always there as a, as a, as a, as a, as a teacher. That's all mental, it isn't, isn't physical. So we, we, we took it uh, apart, and now people hijack this part, and there the mental coach is pushing the right button. No, I'll push the button. I don't need a mental coach. And I'm, I, there's only one mental coach, it's me. Yes, there could be a thing that there is a conflict between if I'm in trouble, if I'm burned out, if I uh, have uh, uh, problems in my family, there's a risk that I carry him with me to, to, the, to, the, to the track or to the field or whatever, then I might be the right person to do, to do the job. That's absolutely true. I, I guide my athletes at the Olympics. Some coaches are more nervous than their athletes. Then they need mental training maybe. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, mainly it's, it's your job uh, as, as a coach because we are paid from Russia and uh, East Germany yeah, Coach, his, uh, uh, his job is to prepare his athletes technically, tactically, conditionally, and physical conditioning, and mentally to do well in competition. So, yes, technically, yes, technically, yes. Condition, physical conditioning, yes. The mental part was included in there. It wasn't excluded by a sports psychologist or a mental coach, it was included in, in there. Then the main thing is. <clears throat> We said, well, it's so complex, you know, the human brain is so complex. Why well, you haven't been studying the human muscle or the human kidney then? Because that's complex too. The complexity isn't, because most of our, our, our uh, coaches are teachers or parents. So if you have a problem with your kids, aren't these the same problems you're having with your athletes? They don't listen to what you tell them to do. <laughs> they... Uh, 
uh, go to party, it's the same program still. So most of my teachers, they, deal, they used to deal with people in this uh, age group. So if you, can, if you were a teacher, in, 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 in a language teacher, and you have difficult children in your, uh, in your uh, classroom, same difficult kids come to, 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 to the field or to the gym. So it doesn't make a difference. Why would you lose all your skills when you're a coach? The language teacher isn't going to call a psychiatrist or a psychologist to, to deal with a difficult uh, 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 student. And as a, as, a, as, a, as a parent, you also don't, don't call the, the, the psychologist all the time. In very special cases, when there's a really serious problem, but there's mainly psychiatry, that's not even psychology, mainly psychiatry. So I don't see that as coaches, we should be helped by, by mental. I've seen more damage than, than uh, and, and most mental coaches create happy losers, that's all. Uh, that's, uh, yeah. Yeah. They rub their back and tell them everything's going to be okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Basically, basically, that's it, you know. And they have all the little trick. It could be focus, it could be visualizing, all the little trick. And that little trick, again, is going to solve all their problems. It's not. It's a complex uh, phenomenon we're looking at. So it's not only focus on the task and everything will be okay. You can have too much focus on the task and then nothing will be okay. Right. <laughs> you know, and I love the example taken the athlete out to Olympic Stadium and looking at the 100 meters. Have you ever seen the movie Hoosiers? Uh, what's, the, what's the name? Hoosiers. It's, uh, no, it, no, it's no. a movie about high school basketball in the state yeah. of Indiana. Yeah, of course, yeah. And Gene Hackman takes yeah. these guys into the yeah. you know, little no like, one-stop-like town in the middle of Indiana. Yeah. Playing, you know, the big team from Indianapolis for the state championship. Yeah. And he takes a tape measure out. Yeah. And he goes, get on that ladder, put it to the goal, and tell me what it says. He said, it's, kid goes, 10 feet, coach. He's like, yeah. yep, basket's still 10 feet high here. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. you know, it's. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. You know, it's, uh, it, it was a pretty <laughs> deep. Absolutely. And you see, again, basically it's simple. Basically, it's simple. So if you boil it, if you know the basics, if you have the basic uh, concept of okay, and you need two things: you need to uh, uh, to be able to mentalize, to think what they think, just on a rational scale, and to empathize, to to feel what they feel. Now, if you can step in their shoes, look through their eyes, then you're more successful than you would think. The hell is he? Well, you people from different cultures. You know, I work with people from from uh, Suriname, uh, from uh, Jamaica, of course, from Nigeria, from the Middle East. So uh, Italy, well, all different cultures. Uh, so somebody says something or something happening, you see them change. You think, what? why are they so upset? You know? And if you can't figure it out, then you haven't been stepping into their brain. They are upset about something, but you can figure it out because you're only dealing with your own brain. You're in your own culture. You look with your own eyes. So if you can... can Ah, now you understand. They see things in a different perspective. Absolutely true. So uh, if you are able to do that, I don't know if I learned that uh, or I always had this. I don't think I had it. I think I learned this. Uh, to see through their eyes and, 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 and step in their shoes. And, okay, what would I think if I would be in this situation as well? I would yeah. be scared as hell as well. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so... That's uh, the beauty of coaching. It's, it's complex and simple at the same time. Uh, most of the time, we, we, it is simple. We make it too complex. And then uh, the scientists make it even more complex and more specialized. And we have to bring it back to, uh, to the core. So uh, that's as an older, uh, older, as a young coach, you tend to complify things. We make it more complex than it really is and try to go into details here, into details there. And as an older coach, you step back a little bit and have a more this helicopter view and more the philosophical view. And then it's, okay, it wasn't... It isn't that difficult. No, now it isn't. When time was 20 years ago, things looked very complicated to me uh, as well. Now I, I step back. I'm not, not coaching. I'm not coaching that much anymore. So now things look a lot easier than looked 20 years ago. Then you go this direction and that direction and go everywhere to find, oh, it's this. It's a muscle biopsy. It's the muscle lab. It's the, it's the brain waves. It's, it, it's this. Now, okay, now you can oversee, you can see the, 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 the forest again through the trees. Yeah. <laughs> Well, Hank, I appreciate you taking two hours out of your Sunday to, to talk with, with me here. I hope we can do this again. Cause in, okay. Yeah. Awesome. Hank, I look forward to speaking with you again real soon, man. You have a good one. Okay. Hey, thanks a lot, uh, Jay. You nice got to it. You with, 
Hope to talk to you soon. Thanks, buddy. Have a good day. Yeah, thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.